open your Bibles to Exodus 14. Exodus 14 in the Old Testament. Tonight, I'm preaching another fear, not message. In fact, the name of this message, the title of this message, is going to be called, When Cornered, Fear Not. And you'll understand why I'm telling that message, tonight's message. When cornered, fear not. Now, I'll be starting with Exodus 14, verse 1. After the ten plagues, horrible plagues, because Pharaoh would not let Moses lead the people out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. A lot of suffering by the Egyptians took place because of bad leadership. It starts with leadership, whether it's spiritual or non-spiritual. When you have bad leadership, it always leads to agony and suffering, one way or the other. And you saw that leading up to the children of Israel departing from the land of bondage, Egypt. In fact, instead of starting with Exodus 14, verse 1, let's just start with Exodus 13, verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go after everything that happened concerning those ten plagues and the last plague being the death of the firstborn. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God, there the word is Elohim, the powerful God, led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Probably a better translation would be let him not through the way of the sea. The way of the sea was the Mediterranean coastline that followed the northern part of Egypt, the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula, all the way up to Palestine. It would just follow the coastline route. But God decided that that's not the way they were going to go. Although that was the closest route, and it says that in Scripture. Although that was, that was near, for God said, let peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. See, God knew that if they took that route, the closest route, and probably the most comfortable route to get to the back to the land of promise, they would be confronted with a lot of angry, ferocious, evil inhabitants that made that territory their territory because Israel has not been in that particular area for over 400 years. Everyone else had a chance to move in, establish their little kingdoms, their little nations, little tribal units, form their little cities, And Israel was not ready to fight. Even though God would go before them and he would win some battles without their help, it would come a time when they would enter the promised land, they had to get ready to do some fighting. The Lord knew that they needed some prep preparation before that, both physically preparing themselves to go against an evil foe or foes and also spiritually to get ready for the test of faith. See, even though the bondage in Egypt was hard, heavy labor, no freedom, but at least they could expect every day to get up, be fed, provide hard labor, and then go back to their families at night if they were lucky and start their day all over again the next day 
day in, day out. They became familiar with that. In a sense, even though they did not like it, and it was not no walk in the park to live that type of lifestyle, they at least knew the Egyptians would protect them because it, they were slaves to the Egyptians. They were par, a, a powerful force, a powerful workforce to accomplish what the Egyptians and its leadership wanted to accomplish. So in a sense, they were protected, they were fed, and they were taken care of. They were accustomed to be taken care of. They didn't have to rely on God to take care of them. The Egyptians did. They might not like their circumstance, but they knew they had some stability even though the circumstance were awful and kept them in bondage. And as soon as they would run into trouble, like most Christians that are, not, that are not ready for trouble, they would run back to their slave masters looking for that protection. Running, run back to what's comfortable, what they could rely on and what they had rely on for hundreds of years. God had to prepare them, and he had to do it in the backside of a desert, prepare them physically and spiritually for the future and what they would face when they went into the land of promise. And that alone required some doing, as if you read through the Old Testament, It becomes obvious the children of Israel were not ready. We're not even close. And God knew it. So what he did is he redirected them. Let's peradventure the people repent, repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with them. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones hence with you. And they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in the pillar of the cloud to lead them the way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day or night, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. You would really believe, you would think, if you were part of that group, or you would like to think, that after seeing everything that happened in Egypt, with all those plagues, hitting all those Egyptians, and nothing happened to you. That was just not a coincidence. You weren't just lucky. And God made sure that you were protected. Why? Because after being protected and provided by the Egyptians, even though the circumstance, like I said, wasn't pleasant, God wanted the, the, the Israel to start understanding who the new provider is going to be and a provider that would lead them out of bondage. And all he was looking for was faith and a connection back with him. Understanding who is the Lord their God and who should be worshipped and praised. You think, with those ten plagues, with this pillar that went in a form of a cloud to lead them by the way, and a pillar of fire 
to give them light by night. That all they needed, that's all they would needed to be convinced that there is a God in heaven that's looking after them. But as you'll see from this point on in Scripture, until they all became cursed except for their children of approximately 20 years or less, because of their faithlessness and their inability to faith in God, they would never see the promised land. Most of Christianity today, you can look, see all the miracles you want. You can see all the signs and wonders. But give you a new set of problems tomorrow. You need a new set of signs and wonders and miracles for that day. Yesterday's miracles, yesterday's signs and wonders are no longer sufficient. Prove it to me today, Lord, that you're still the Lord of yesterday with all your signs and miracles. They would never faith in the Lord their God. Moses grieved for them because of them. God grieved. But they never grieved to the point where they came to the knowledge unto thee, O God, I sinned. And from this, this day forward, even though I might sin again, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to faith in you. That's the sad story with the children of Israel. But even during this sad story of them not recognizing who the Lord God Elohim was, there's still hope. There's still a message that we can apply to our daily lives today. I sure do. And we pick that up with verse 1, chapter 14. Now, I read these verses to you, and I preach on these particular verses concerning another message and giving you the geographical location of where this actually took place. Not the typical traditional locations. You can't go to a Bible bookstore or any bookstore any Christian bookstore, any secular bookstore that has biblical information, including even the best theological seminaries, without them pointing out two particular routes the children of Israel's exodus took place. A starting point and eventually where they went. And they don't even come close. And I've covered this before, and that's not part of this message. You have to go back to the archives and find it. And where the true location, where that crossing of the Red Sea took place. Not the typical traditional location you see in Bible maps that give the geographical location of several different spots. Wrong side of the Sinai Peninsula, by the way, on the westerly side of the Sinai Peninsula, when it actually was on the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula. <clears throat> But that's not the subject matter tonight. So I'm just going to read right through these scriptures. But those of you who have been here a while, you'll remember when I preached on this particular chapter and gave you the exact geographical locations where this took place. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn. And I've told you back before when I preached on these messages. The Lord turned them around. They were heading one way, but the Lord had a different direction for them to go. And he spoke unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pi Haharoth. Those of you who remember that? Where exactly that was? And between Migdal, which is the Canaanite Tower, which I located in previous message to you before in the past, and the sea, and over against Baal Safan, or the Lord of the North, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Without going to detail, because I don't have time to go into detail, because I already covered this before. Once they went through a meandering, hilly passageway, 
on both sides of a narrow passageway, there was unmanageable terrain to cross. And if it wasn't for this passageway, probably cut out by a, a river stream, a dried up river stream that led to the ocean, you couldn't get there. And once you went for miles on this meandering system, it would lead you out into a beachhead, a big enough beachhead that could sustain the amount of people that left during this exodus period from Egypt. But once you got to this beachhead, you couldn't go south because it was blocked by a mountainous terrain, geographical southern location. And unless you get on a boat and get on the what here in the Bible causes the Red Sea, that was the only way of escape. The mountains came all the way up to the seaside and you couldn't go around them without going into the water, period. So there was no escape to the south. And to the north, the Canaanite Towers, where Egypt's armies and control of the Sinai Peninsula extended all the way to the eastern edge of the Sinai Peninsula. And that was one of the areas that you couldn't cross over either. So once you landed on this beachhead after the meandering system that you went through to get there, the only way out of there was either crossing that Red Sea, which was physically impossible for them, or going back to the same meandering system for miles and miles and miles until you get out to the desert again. Nothing but cliff sides and hills through this meandering system, and those were unpassable. So you just couldn't climb over them, not with this many people and what they were carrying. So there's one way in and one way out. So that's what they were encamped in. And the story leads up to them fearing because when Pharaoh found out they left and his heart turned, he had second thoughts about letting them go. So he went after them. Let's just continue reading it. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness had shut them in. Not the wilderness necessarily, but the area, the geographical location had shut them in because there was no way out. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and Anne of his servants was turned against the people and they said why have we done this like I said they had second thoughts letting the people go that we have let Israel go from serving us and he made ready his chariot And took his people with him. Now this story, like I said, is very familiar to most of the people that are listening to me tonight. But bear with me. I'm getting to a point. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots. 600 chosen chariots. And all the chariots of Egypt. It's just not 600 chosen chariots. And all the chariots of Egypt. And captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. A high hand. But the Egyptians, after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and horsemen and his army. The Egyptians pursued, pursued after them. And overtook them in camping by, in camping by the sea, besides Pi or Phi Hararoth, before Bel Safon. Now I already described briefly what that location was. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. 
Literally, they were terrified, afraid. They were trembling in their sandals or whatever they were wearing. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, you would too. Now, let's put some perspective on this. They were closed in. No way of escape unless they could be able to cross that Red Sea somehow. They didn't have boats. They didn't have rubber rafts. They didn't have canoes. And they probably couldn't swim across. And they sure couldn't get across with the goods they carried out of Egypt. Wagon full. Many wagon full of goods, jewels, precious things. Listen, the children, the, the Egyptians in Egypt wanted them to leave. After that last terrible plague of the firstborn death, go back to it. It's in chapter 12, verse 33. And the Egyptians, after the death of the firstborn, they had enough. From leadership all the way down to the peasant Egyptian, if that's what the lowest level of class was in Egypt. They had enough. They had enough of the plagues. They had enough of the stubbornness of Pharaoh. And even Pharaoh had enough. He was convinced temporarily that maybe the wisest thing to do is let them go. They even took my firstborn. And that's what Pharaoh did. And the Egyptians, in verse 33, in chapter 12, were urgent upon the people. They impressed them to leave. Go now. We don't want you here any longer. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. Get the bleep out. No longer welcome here. The welcome mat's been taken in. It's time for you to depart and never come back. Why? For they said, we will be all dead men. If you don't leave, we're all going to die. So get the bleep out, like I said earlier. And that's what they did. And the children of Israel, in verse 35, did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed, not borrowed, requested of, of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and remnant. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. They want them out of there so bad, they'll give them anything. They'll give them anything to leave. So, they, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians or snatched away the physical, material things from the Egyptians. They went out heavy laden with material things. Silver and gold. Clothing for the trip. You name it. You want it? Here it is. The only condition, get out of here and get out of here fast. And that's what Israel did. And they traveled, at the very least, 210 miles before Pharaoh caught up with him with his huge army. Let's put some flesh and blood in this story. Israel's pinned in, in this beachhead. They came through the meander Part of that last part of the journey of the trip before reaching the sea, I'm sure once they reached that particular area on that beach jet, I mean they have resorts there now in our day. I'm sure it looked good. But I'm sure a lot of them saying, Okay, now what? We can't sustain ourselves here. Now what does Moses and God have in mind for us? How in the heck are we going to be crossing over to that other part? Of land that we can see from a distance, but we don't know how we're going to get there. Before the Pharaoh and the Egyptians showed up chasing them, I'm sure there was some murmuring already going on in the camp saying, okay, now what? You let us here, but now what? We can't go south. We definitely can't go north. Only way out of here is going back or crossing that sea. 
So when Pharaoh and his army showed up, it sent a panic throughout the camp. A panic. Why? You read the description of the horsemen, the chariots, and his army. Some have calculated at least 50,000 horsemen. We already know 600 of the choicest chariots minimum. 50,000 horsemen and about 200,000 footmen that were a part of the Egyptian army. So at the very least, somewhere between a, a quarter of a million and above, barreling down on them, ready to catch them or kill them. They didn't know what the Egyptians' intentions were. All they knew, they were coming, and they were coming fast, and they had no way of escape. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. Their eyes were now on the Egyptians. Before you criticize these Israelites, saying, I would have done that if I was there. Don't be too sure. And don't be too sure about what I'm already about what I'm going to tell you and preach to you tonight versus, uh, concerning verses 11 and 12. Don't be too sure. Yes, it's obvious. They lifted up their eyes upon the Egyptians. And they were terrified and they were afraid and they were trembling. And they cried unto the Lord. Now what they cried was faithlessness. A declaration of faithlessness. A declaration of not trusting God who has led them this far, who has spared them from horrific plagues that took place in Egypt, that provided the miracle, if you want, I think it was a miracle that Pharaoh let these people go. I mean, Pharaoh dismantled his financial support system for his country, the slave labor. Egypt never was the same after this. Egypt's heyday was over. Yes, you have spurts of it coming back, but nothing like in its former days. Nothing like in the days before Israel left. That's a matter of history. Read it for yourself if you don't believe the Bible. And here, at least 250,000 trained warriors, men of war, some riding the beasts of war, And some of those beasts of war attach the chariots that can do quite a bit of damage if they attack Israel. And Israel is afraid. It's easy to sit back and say, now, well, they should have lifted their eyes up to the Lord instead of lifting their eyes up to the Egyptians and seeing what the Egyptians vast army coming quickly upon them with the intentions probably to either kill them or take them back. They should have kept their eyes on the Lord. Next time you're in a set of circumstances that look like it's going to kill you, remember your words. Remember your words. I do it all the time. I try to imagine that I wouldn't be that way. But when then I rattle what's loose up here long enough, I come to realize I'm probably not that much different from those children of Israel far as how I react when the circumstances first come upon me. And you're probably not that much different either. You might think you are but I doubt it seriously. And the next verses will prove that for most of you that listen to me tonight. 
We all act the same way. Oh, no, look what is coming at me. Look the bleep that's heading my way. Is your first reaction at that very instant is to look up and make that connection with Jesus? Think about anything. And I've got people below this world tonight. Think about it. Whatever hit you this last week, this last month, this year, and it was a big, hurtful hit in your life that you thought would do you in or kill you, or at least a big enough hit to do you serious damage. Did you immediately look up and say, Jesus, help me? Or was your first reaction something different? Be honest with yourself. Don't sit there and give me some... Well, I thought I did. Excuse. I'm not there. I'm not throwing stones at you tonight. I'm just as guilty. This message is for me too. No. I lift up and I look at my circumstance before I lift up and look at Jesus most of the time. And if the circumstances are big enough and hurtful enough and could do some serious damage, it takes me a while longer to look up and lift my eyes unto Jesus. The salvation of my soul and the deliverer of my circumstances and troubles. I don't like self-righteous Christians. Well, maybe I didn't make that connection right away, but I live in the premise that I'm fading through it. I'm going to show you how silly that is and how much of a habit your thought process has become that you become worthless in dealing with the circumstances or allowing Christ to deal with the circumstances. But what are you saying tonight? Why are you ins insulting this? I'm not insulting anyone. It starts with me. I'm preaching first to myself, and if anybody else gets anything out of it, great. What happened? They cried unto the Lord. They were terrified. They were afraid. They were trembling. And they said unto Moses, because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Don't forget, they just witnessed miracle after miracle, plague after plague. It didn't affect them, but they got delivered from those horrific plagues. They got delivered from not watching their firstborn die in front of them. They got delivered from Egypt. They got renewed strength, which I haven't covered tonight, but in other passages, renewed strength. They not only travel, and I've preached on this before, but pra travel quickly because they were energized physically to make that journey. And now because they came to a bump in the road, and it's a large bump, don't get me wrong, a large bump. Oh, they started crying. And they start crying insults. To, yes, directed towards Moses, but more importantly, insulting God. Insulting God. Tempting God. Why'd you bring us out here? Die? And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in the wilderness. Wherefore thou hast dealt this way with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we tell thee in Egypt, we, we told thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Obviously, Moses is not very well accepted, especially the message he first came to deliver. Pack your bags, it's going to be time to go soon. The Egyptians didn't fade in that. They didn't fade in that promise. Remember, 300 or so years earlier, Joseph was still around. 
And they were all fading, including Joseph. That's why we have it given to us here in the end of chapter 13, the reminder that Joseph wanted his bones carried away with them when they were going to be leaving Egypt, when God would deliver them from the hands of their enemy and from bondage. And from bondage. So much for faithing in the word of God. So much for faithing in the promise. Well, I'm not guilty of that because even though I might have doubts at times, even though I, not, I don't like the circumstances, and even though I might not lift up my eyes to Jesus immediately. I get around to that point eventually and I start faithing that he will take care of my situation. Oh, do you? Oh, do you? See, I get to talk to a lot of people, a variety of people, and I see where they're at in their Christian walk and what they come to be accustomed to And how they should practice and live the life of faith. I want to be stepping on some toes tonight, and I know it. Believe me, I have some bruises on my toes. And it comes by the way of the Word of God. Well, I'm not insulting God, I'm nowhere near. Or have the attitude as these Israelites. I sure don't demonstrate it with my physical presence or what comes out of my mouth. What Israel said in verse 11 and 12. Are you sure? See, faithlessness comes in many different forms, folks. And the devil disguises the forms it comes in. So you don't see it coming. Because you got accustomed to this is the way you're supposed to do it. And you don't even know what you're doing. What do you mean? I've been just as guilty. Most of you listen to me tonight, if not all have been just as guilty in being as, ju- as being as much faithless as these Israelites were in the Old Testament. Or disfaithing as these Israelites were in the Old Testament. Well, I don't get your drift. Whatever your circumstance, whether it's been in the past, whether it's present, Whatever your circumstance, problems, or troubles, oh, you develop the habit pattern of saying, well, I'm going to fade through this. You'd be surprised how many people say that and disconnect from hearing the word of God. You cannot have the so be it faith if you disconnect from hearing the word of God. Well, I read it every day. It's not the same. It's not the same. And Paul knew what he was writing in Romans. When he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hopefully you're listening to someone that can deliver the impact you need to receive that you just don't get by reading. I'm not saying not to read the Word of God. That's silly if you believe I'm saying that. It'd be silly if you'd even think that. I'm just saying that's not enough. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And both times the word faith there is in those passages is pistis 
It's the peace of faith. It's what I call the star of faith. It's faith that's brought about by persuasion. You become, you become persuaded by what you hear over and over again to be true. And then once you have that solidified, it moves you into this second level of faith, what some have called the amen, and I call the so be it faith. It's the faith that is the pistale faith that has you convinced because you've been persuaded by the pieces faith to put all your trust and confidence on Jesus and his word. That means all your focus is on him. All your focus is on what he can provide for you if you keep your focus on him, that's true prosperity, not this ridiculous nonsense that's being preached out there. Well, I'm not sure where you're going with this. I haven't insulted God like these Israelites did in verse 11 and 12. It's a demonstration of this faith. No trust and confidence in God, even with all the signs, miracles, and wonders. All those signs, miracles, and wonders is still not as much as we have here today if you truly faith in him and his word. But we're still guilty. And I'll show you how we're guilty. And this is just one way. I don't have time tonight to go into all the different facets of it. If you're anything like me, and I don't think you're that much different, When you are dealing with a circumstance where you consider this the mother of all circumstance, the mother of all your problems, or at least close to it, and you don't know how to get out of it, you don't see the way of escape. Oh, you're fainting that God will provide you the way of escape. But you're missing something along that journey. You're missing something. What do you mean? The connection with him. See, the children of Israel did not sin because they cried unto, out unto the Lord. They sinned because how they cried out unto the Lord. But once again, you're saying, well, I didn't do that. Well, really. Back to being some, if you're anything like me. What is the first thing? I'm going to, be honest with you. What is the first thing that I do when I deal with a hefty circumstance? And sometimes it doesn't have to be that hefty, folks. Let's just say circumstance in general. What is the first thing I do? Even though I know I'm going to fade through it, what is the first thing I do? Because I'm telling you, the first thing that I do breaks that connection of faith immediately, even though I believe I'm fading through it. I start the wheels turning with the matter between my ears. I start turning my own brain power loose on how I am going to solve the circumstance, how I am going to solve the problem, how I am going to get through it. And when I do that, it's no different than what the children of Israel did. Because they lifted their eyes up to the Egyptians. That starts the ball in motion. That starts the wheel spinning in the wrong direction. Because you start trying to think quickly how you're going to get out of that circumstances and what you can do. Well, God helps them to help themselves. That is such a bunch of baloney. I don't know where people get that from, but it's not Bible. I'm sorry, it's not Bible. My Bible says God will help them, the ones who faith in him. There's no other plan B. 
Plan B is our own doings. Is our own man-made efforts to try to solve our own problems. Sometimes we create our problems. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just live through life and it just hits us. And we don't know why it hit, because you were doing everything right. It doesn't matter how you receive the circumstance. It doesn't matter how it started and where it's going to end. Through it, all that matters is you lift your eyes up to Jesus. And we're just as guilty when we start our wheels in motion, the gears turning between our ears, trying to figure out what we can do to solve the problem. I tell people around me all the time, if you spend just as much time making that connection with Christ, because he's our mediator now unto the Father to take our circumstances to him, if you spend as much time in a still and quiet place communicating to the Lord, what concerns you and listening to what can help you, hopefully that's rightly divided, your problems seem like like nothing. I don't even know if you would consider it to be a problem. Because that's what builds faith, is that connection. We break the connection every time we allow ourselves to be the solution to the problem. I have people losing their homes with me tonight that spend hours upon hours trying to solve their problem, coming up with all sorts of ideas how they could get themselves out of it. Professing Christians. Professing Christians that say they're faithing through it. But they have not even given equal time to Christ concerning what troubles you. I could preach this because I've been guilty of it. I could preach this because I know I'll be probably guilty in the future of it. I told you before, I started, I have several hundred messages ready to go on Fear Not. And I keep preaching to myself over and over again. Because I find myself in, myself in positions where I'm disfaving. And allowing Satan to take control of the situation because I become an instrument of his because I'm not giving God the attention that it deserves, that he requires to enter into my problem. And it's a shame. I'm sorry. It's a shame. Starting with me. If the shoe fits, wear it. That you'll spend more time and attention dealing with your problem. How you can solve it. Than going into the closet. And at least giving equal time to the Lord. To somehow to commune to you and you commune to him. Concerning it. We all been guilty. We all have been guilty. Paul says to be instant in prayer. Be instant for prayer. You think faith is going to be sustaining itself if you don't communicate with the Lord? Faith comes by hearing. And hopefully you're listening to someone that's telling you you need to keep that communication tight. I think I've preached long enough now that I've given you two principles that come out of the word of God through John 15. Abide in me. That means you abiding in Christ because of, if you're a brand, you're, <coughs> you're not connected to the vine any longer. You're not being nourished. Period. Sorry. You might think you are, but you're not. And B, you know what the other one is, loving one another and how that relates to the Great Commission. Abide in me. I said it's not all about you, but it has to start with you. God's not going to find willing soldiers of Jesus Christ if they're not willing to abide in him. In the Greek, remain and persevere in him continually. 
I've known some Christians that go around saying, well, I have faith. I'm fading through it. All they have developed is words into a habit pattern of what to say, like a parrot. That's learned to mimic the right thing to say. Oh, I almost could feel through the camera some of the aggravation out there because what I'm preaching. Well, if you feel that way, then you need to be listening to it. I've told you three or four months ago, you need to wipe the slate clean. And it's time for new growth. We are just as guilty as the children of Israel, just in a different way, but still insulting God. When we put our own ideas, our own methods, our own strategy, our own creative ways, our own way of escape in, ahead of his, no different. We might be crying out to the Lord, but just a little bit differently than the way the children of Israel did, but the same result. So what's the remedy? The remedy is what Paul said, what it says here. I mean, you go to Romans 12. You go to Philippians 4, 6. You go to many different verses. Let's just go to Romans 12 quickly, and I'll come back to this to conclude this message. You go to the Romans, book of Romans, <clears throat> Chapter 12, I've been on this verse, it's, just, it's the chapter on service. I preached on verse 1 so many times, most of you probably have it memorized by now, but he gets down to verse 12, rejoicing in hope. There the word in the Greek is elpis. What is the kind of hope is he talking about? Nothing of this world, eternal salvation is what's referenced there. So rejoicing in eternal salvation, patient or Enduring in tribulation. That's expected. Jesus said that was expected. And most of you don't have no problem with that. You don't have, you have the problem with the tribulation just like I do. You don't like it. But you don't have to fall in love with it. You just have to have enduring and endurance. Knowing that your eternal salvation will be secure if you keep fading through it and keep connected, keep remaining and abiding in him. So endurance and tribulation, how many of you have continuing, continuing instant in prayer? Prayer is that connection. Nothing super, no secret code in your communication with Christ. Just an open conversation about what's going on in your life. Nothing complicated. You don't have to speak in tongues. You have to continue instant in prayer. Now that word instant, continuing instant, comes with a deeper meaning in the Greek. It's also related to endurance. But endurance that leads you in a certain direction. And here is the certain direction is to eternal salvation. Over and over in Paul's letters, you see it. You go to Philippians 4. You don't have to go there quickly because I'm just going to get I'm going to go right in and out of it. Verse 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. Paul is constantly reminding us that we have to stay connected because he knows when we don't stay connected, we become crafty, slick individuals. Hot shots for Jesus in our own sick minds. Thinking that we could spare God this one. We'll take care of this ourselves. Because we got a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. You got plan nothing. You don't have any plans. God has planned for you. And you don't even, might not even know what it is yet. 
But he knows the Egyptians are at the door. And he knows they're coming with a full force of evil, ready to attack and kill you if that's what the intention is. So what is that God has asked us to do? Let's read it. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. And that's why I'm labeling this message and gave it the title, When Cornered, because that's what they were, cornered. When cornered, fear not. Fear ye not. Don't be terrified. Don't tremble. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. But fear ye not. Stand still. Literally, stand fast in an unyielding position. If I'm supposed to be at this beachhead, then that's where I'm going to stand. God knows where I'm at. God knows where the Egyptians are at. God knows the circumstance that I'm in. You might have got, like I said, yourself in the circumstance, and maybe you had nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter. Once God takes over, it doesn't matter how you got there. But you're there. What he's saying is, don't be afraid of it. Don't fear it. But stand fast. And what, Let me give you the rest of the translation. Stand fast in an unyielding position, presenting yourselves. How? In communication to him that, Lord, I learned to do this with my own communication with God. I'll let you in on a little secret. Lord, I have all these racing thoughts in my brain how I can get out of my problem. But help me and erase those thoughts and let me be an open source for you to work through and implement your plan through me regarding this circumstance. And that's like I said, most of us don't do that immediately. We come up with plan A's, plan B's, plan C's. We have all these ideas how we're going to get ourselves out of the problem that we're in. No different than the Egyptians, just using a different method. But still insulting God. Still allowing us to develop some disfaith in our lives instead of staying connected in prayer in communication, in hearing the word of God which builds faith so then you can act upon it. And sometimes God, with the answer, is going to require some acting on faith in your behalf. On your behalf. I know it's happened to me. Sometimes the answer is worse than the circumstance. You ever had that one happen to you? I sure had. Have. What do you mean i got to go through this route to solve the problem? I can come up with a better plan than that, God. Yeah, see how far it goes. And Moses said to the people, Fear ye not, stand fast in an unyielding position, present yourselves, and see what? The salvation of the Lord. Not the salvation of Joe. Not the salvation of whatever your name is out there tonight and your big plan and how you're going to get out of your circumstance. The salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. Now, some of you are going to really hate this part. Today can mean today. In the Hebrew, it can mean today. The word that's used there can mean tomorrow. It can mean next week, next month, next year. Well, I, you had me, and I was starting to build some faith. And starting to recognize that I need to make that connection immediately when these circumstances show up. And not lean into my own understanding, but unto his. Until you got to this today part. You mean I might have to wait a period of time? Absolutely. It could be today. It could be the next hour. It could be tomorrow. But it also could be next week, next month, and next year. Same response. That we should present. And what is that? Not fearing. Standing still and stand fast. 
in an unyielding position, knowing that God has our back. He knows what's best for us. We need to present ourselves. How? Lord, I'm here. I want to put my eyes there. That's where the circumstance is. That's where the enemy is. That's where the Egyptians is. And it's easy to go like this, but I want to stay focused on you. And I don't want to look this way either because that's where all my plans that I've developed that I think could get me out of this problem. Can't look left, can't look right. Let me just keep my eyes on you. See, I have developed these little formulas, if that's what you want to call them, through God's Word to try to understand it in such a basic way that even a hardhead like me can't see it. Egyptians on the left, my solutions to the problem on the right, both, both will lead me astray and probably off, no, definitely off the path and the journey that you want me to take. So therefore, the only conclusion that's left is lift my eyes unto Jesus. Lift, keep my eyes in his word. Keep hearing and hearing. Pistis, which leads to pisteo. For the Egyptians whom ye see today, ye shall see them, them again no more forever. Actually, it doesn't say forever, by the way. It says for a long time. The Lord, now that I know what I'm supposed to be doing, the Lord shall fight for you. That means he's going to fight for us. And ye shall hold what? Your peace. Literally, ye shall be silent and quiet. The next time a circumstance rears his ugly head, shut up. Stop thinking so hard about it. Believe me, it's hard to do. And take it to Jesus. And keep it there. And if you have a hard time getting to that point, don't insult God by spending more time on your solution than going to a secret place and communing to the Lord what He will have you do. Stop insulting God. That's the message tonight. Don't think that you're not like the children of Israel. We all have traits of it. Thank God we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But not, don't fall into this doctrine that once saved, always saved. You could slip out of being saved, my friend. How? By recognizing yourself as the master of your, of your problems, the solution giver, instead of denying yourself, by taking the cross, keep what's active in your life, no matter what the circumstances, that is employed in the word of God and the way you were called to do it. And keep following Jesus. The message that I preach doesn't change no matter what the subject matter. The Lord shall fight for you and he shall, and ye shall hold your peace or be silent and quiet. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me? Okay, they're crying and they're a bunch of idiots that just finished insulting me. Why are you crying? Why are you crying, Moses? Speak of the children of Israel that they go forward. Literally, Nassau is the Hebrew to march in this journey or continue the march in the journey. Where? Into the water? What you've been called to do. Let's fast forward to our time. Your circumstances, your problems will always be ever-changing. There'll be new ones and different ones. New problems. Some of the new problems 
will be greater than the old problems. And you wish you had the old problems. They were, you look back and say, those were easy compared to now. Circumstances will come and go. Problems will come and go. Tribulation and trials will come and go. What's constant, that you keep marching in the journey. That you keep marching the journey and you keep your eyes off your problems and unto Jesus. And don't be a cement mount with Jesus. Commune with him. Abide in him. Remain in him. Persevere in him. And see if he won't have a better solution than you in your circumstance. The end result of this, you know the story. God did provide deliverance. And they crossed over. And they crossed over on dry land. But lift up thy rod, verse 16, and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. And the, tri it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. See, when we decide to lift up our own rod and not the rod of the Lord, which now is his word, I guarantee you'll be walking to sinking mud or better yet, quicksand. Well, it might seem like the right solution at first when you first start acting upon it. But if that's not what God wants you to do or be where you think you should be, you're walking into quicksand, folks. Muddy soil, though, have you so knee-deep you can't move one step in front of another. But if you keep the journey, you keep the marching, you keep recognizing there's nothing wrong in crying unto the Lord. But let's don't cry to complain. Cry and say, this is yours. This is yours. And before I do anything foolish or head in the wrong direction and make it the stu stupid decision, I want you to take this circumstance, Lord, Because you know how to deal with it far better than I can. Far better than I can. And wait. Some of you are just too anxious. You're just too anxious. You need the answer now. My word says it could be today. You might be lucky. Could be tomorrow. Somewhat lucky. Could be next week. That's eh, bearable. Next month. Oh, that's pushing it. Next year, I don't know how I'm going to make it. You're going to make it if you keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep abiding in him. You're going to make it. But it requires two things. Abiding in him through the communication that's established, hopefully. If not, it's never too late to start. And waiting. And believe me, it takes faith to wait. If you think it doesn't, then I don't know what you've been waiting on. It takes faith to wait because it is telling God that you're not going to irrationally make a move while being sure this is the direction he wants you to take. Well, how am I going to know? How am I going to know? The only answer I can give you to that is what I've seen in my own life. When I'm connected and the connection is not severed, it's like a good landline. You ever get it like in the olden days? When I say olden days, about 30 years ago, you would call somebody and you hear all this crackling and you can't get through and it's just across the street you're dialing. That's not quite the connection I'm talking about. That's not kind of the connection you need. You need a complete, clear connection. And the only way you're going to establish that connection is to keep it established. Don't hang up on it. Don't put it on hold while you try to figure something else out. And like I said, at the very least, you should be applying at least 
equal amount of time, even though I think it's a lot more than that, equal amount of time of taking it to the Lord and keeping that connection clear. When you compare how much time you're trying to spend on the situation, you try to figure out how you're going to get out of it. What happened? They crossed the Red Sea. They were delivered. And in verse 2, in chapter 15, when they sang in Moses and the children of Israel, this song was written. It says, the Lord is my strength. Why? Because he trumpeted gloriously in verse 1. The horse and rider had he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength in song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him a habitation. Guess what the habitation is now? Us. We are the temple. Us. We are his habitation. His spirit dwells in us. And I will prepare him a habitation, my father's God. And I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. Really, literally, is champion of war. The Lord is his name. And I've said this over and over. There's only one name to call out now, here in 2010, and that is Jesus. No other name in Scripture even reaches God's ears because Christ commanded us, and he declared it to us in the gospel record, the only way the Father will hear anything is through Jesus. We don't need no other name now. We're not living in the Old Testament. All we need is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our champion of war, and Jesus is his name. And Jesus is his name. And see if he doesn't go to war over your circumstance, whatever they may be. I don't care how small it is or how large it is. Whatever your circumstances today, Christ is working on it. He's already gone to war because there's a spiritual identity and enemies that need to be dealt with in the unseen world that are also trying to bring you down through your circumstances that he has to deal with as he's given us the physical demonstration how this circumstance will turn out, what the outcome of it will be. He's our champion. He's always been. He will deal with your circumstance. He's asking us to fear not Stand fast, presenting yourselves to see the salvation that he will provide, which he'll show you in his time. Not your time, not my time, his time. Don't be caught, as the children of Israel were, insulting the Lord. by thinking you're getting away with it by saying you're fading. But yet you're working your own way of escape out of the situation. You've learned to put a few phrases together that you think is pleasing God. But there's only one way to please Him. Keeping that connection strong. Keeping connected to the vine that nourishes us while we keep marching in faith in the journey that he has us on, period. Everything else is hogwash. It is a waste of time, including ours. Our efforts always fall short. Since sin was introduced into mankind, our efforts are pathetic. But Christ in us and through us, is our champion. And he will see us through, no matter what. So when you're cornered, fear not. And stand fast. Christ is at work, folks. And that's all we need. 